the sixth Tuesday in February is always when I have my office hours. And I will share my notes. Maybe just give it a minute here, see if Melissa comes back. She, she texted on the Slack that her internet is unstable. So, yeah, okay. there she comes. All right. Welcome back, Melissa. <laughs> Sean Guyans. Oh, um. Mine is it was a pink sign. There's a bad word in the title. So today, um, looks like on the agenda, is there anything that people want to add before we get started with the, the two things that are on the agenda? I know last time we discussed some summary work that Melissa, I think Melissa did. Um, and uh, we have this OSPO activities metrics and metrics model. Is there anything that anyone wants to add to the agenda before we get started? I don't. So or at least from my side, I don't have a lot of updates. I have to say, unfortunately. Okay, that's all right. I'm happy to discuss. Uh, I think we have some new people on the call, so maybe we can uh, go over what's already there. Okay, so yeah, let's open up with, um, we discussed this. This is some really um, nice summary work that I think, Melissa, you did this, right? Yeah, I started it, and then we worked on it together during the meetings. So it's kind of looking at existing models uh, and we discussed how they might apply to um, scientific software. And there was a new model we discussed about contributor experience or contributor community health. And some discussion here of user store. Oops, that went too wide. I don't know how. To, I don't know how oh, there we go. I got that sidebar and I wasn't sure what I did to deserve it. So it's trying to make it smaller for people on smaller screens. Um, so if I think if there's any other additional comment about this, I think um, was that this is um, some of the questions, user stories that went along with that. And I don't know if in this group we want to think about developing that metric model, or if that metric model is something that we want to try to be, have developed in the common group or the metrics model working group um because this this sounds like from the discussion we had last week something that we want to probably build out we do and i think vinod you were going to take a look at some existing metrics associated yeah. with i don't know if you had a chance to do that yes i've done that and uh, in front of each i've written uh, the existing matrix. So if you scroll it down uh, to okay. that document, okay. yeah, uh, yep, yeah, those all those in this uh, pink color, like metrics and concerns. Ah, okay, all right. I now I'm seeing. Okay, your comments. So yeah, when you... so existing. I've put the existing metrics in front of every question that we are trying to answer uh, in that. Like a mm -hmm. metric that might be able to address that question. And mm -hmm. yes. Gotcha. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Vinod. So, which, um, you know, under our new way of working, I think we're trying to liaise with uh, open source scientific folks. And uh, as we identify models, I think the intention of the, the working with, with scientific software groups is to recognize the kinds of models that they might need and the metrics underlying them, and then to try to build them out um, inside the either common or metric model working groups. Am I, am I understanding the flow you, are, you want to follow correctly, Matt? Okay. Yep, that we don't necessarily want to do. Like at this point, I think with what Vinod provided, we could take it to common mm -hmm. or to take it to the metrics model group and start actually using the template that we have and building it out and then we can bring it back to this group and you know like 
Melissa and Anessa and other folks that join can be like, yeah, that's that looks good or that's not looking so hot. You know what I mean? And we can just kind of talk through it there and iterate that way. Yeah, because so, I guess that was my question following. And, and I think that's what you're touching on is like, what is the process that we follow now? Like, right. let's say that we have an initial idea and yeah. I think it would be nice to get more feedback from the community, but I think it's kind of right now. We, I think everyone is just so busy. I don't know if it's sci-fi. I don't know what it is, but we're finding it hard to get people to respond and kind of participate. But um, I think that's the idea is like getting a little bit more feedback. And then if we decide to go with this, how does that happen? So I'm, I'm seeing you folks say this goes to putting it on a template, maybe going through the models working group yep. and then uh, developing something. Yeah, so we're, we're, to be honest, Melissa, this is kind of new to us, like these context working groups like this. And so the intention is, is that in these groups, like the one here or corporate OSPOs or university OSPOs, that we don't really ask these communities to do that type of maybe detail work. Um, and so we can do that and then just bring it back. I, honestly, what we have here what I'm looking at on Sean's screen between the user stories and then what Vinod provided is basically the metric model, to be honest with you. It's it's pretty close. Yeah. And so at this point, I think it's mostly just um, copy and pasting, like sort of copy and pasting what we have there and getting it into the kind of official metric model template. And then, then we can bring it back to this group or just put it in Slack when it's done. And what, I can is, take the action item to do that. That's not a problem. Yeah. When is the next metric model working group? Because I'm not seeing It's that actually going to be in, th it, the next one is actually July 4th. And so we're not having it. So it's uh, going to. Okay. July 18th. Then. There yeah, we go. Exactly. Okay. Now I'm finding it. Okay. I was looking for it so I could uh, actually open it. And, I think uh, this is easy enough to do, put into a template asynchronously yeah no i'm i was just thinking i would um add a link to the um july 18th one. gotcha and then somehow um that's way too big <laughs> i'll fix that later but i'll, okay, that makes I'll sense. fix that later that way there's a marker in that group's minutes for the contributor experience and community health model Okay. And do we want to have um uh one, one do we want to is there one of these that's a higher priority than others? I would say first one contributor experience. Uh while I was finding the metrics, like what are the existing metrics, I feel a lot of overlap between these two. So maybe we can look at that like overlap. Okay, so that thank you. Uh, I feel like uh, the project sustainability uh, questions that there are uh, that are in the project sustainability are similarly addressed in the uh, contributor experience. So, yeah, I, I I agree with that. I think my my thinking when I separated the two and why I thought two models would be necessary is because. I was thinking specifically of the case of scientific projects that don't necessarily have a community and e either they are smaller or they are contained in like a lab or university institutional uh, setting. And maybe the contributor experience model is too much to ask of them. Okay. And so the sustainability would be a little bit, you know, a lower bar, but I don't know. I'm, um, that was my thinking when I separated the two, but I agree. There's a lot of overlap. Yeah. So maybe then we can refine the metrics or concerns or user stories. Then I'll be able to more link with the existing or maybe see in, there are no existing. Like I see the governance in the previous one, the governance over here, you know, the this kind yeah. of things that I was feeling like there's a lot of overlapping over there. But I, I, I get your concept that these are two different contexts trying to assess different angles. Uh, but yes, so. Okay, so um, I've take, uh, Matt's got the action item to put them into the metrics model template with contributor experience being the, the first that we develop. 
Um, both of them are linked in the metrics model working group. And I think if there's any further elaboration from this working group, that will, you know, if you think it's something and want to add it to the notes that uh, Melissa started, I think that will be helpful to, to the creation of a metric model. I'm looking at those two links in the metrics model minutes. Are they working? It's, it's the same link. Can you repeat link. that? Because I'm going to in so I don't know what's happening. So I'll be right back. Sure. Okay. I think I think they did go to different places. Oh, there was the links to two different parts. Two different of the bookmarks. Document. Yeah, two different oh, bookmarks. Sorry. I was trying okay. to be clever and <laughs> create links to the same document, but different places in the same document. I see. Okay. So I was, I was trying uh, to get fancy. And then I tried um, to get fancy by <laughs> switching them over to use the title, which just makes no sense. I'll fix that. Now that I know what you're uh, trying to do, I'll just fix that. Uh, uh, sorry. I, 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 was, I don't think we've probably done that before. I was trying to introduce some <laughs> kind of newfangledness, so apologize for that. I think that Melissa was going to come back, but um, uh, I don't the next thing on the agenda are, I think, Matt, you put this in here, the OSPO activities. Yeah, found and determined on this. Um, do you want to drive here? Uh, <laughs> because I don't know which slide you. Let's you know. just go to the top. OK, so this is the more I think about this, the more, believe it or not, I like it. And I like it particularly for framing in the context groups and the context working groups as a way to think about what a metric or metric model could do for you if you're a scientific software community or you're an OSPO at a university or you're an OSPO at an organization. Okay. So like when we have the prior, as an example, when we have a prior discussion, like what is the most important metric model for scientific software communities? Mm -hmm. It's a fine question, but like, what is it helping? You know, like how do we understand what, for example, the highest priority metric model, whatever that might be, is is doing to help you as a community or you as an OSPO or, you know, um, you as a university OSPO or a corporate OSPO. So for a long time, this had been called like matur maturity model or stages of growth kind of thing. And I, I agree that it's when we talk about like maturity or growth, it 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 doesn't necessarily imply uh, well, it maybe implies kind of the wrong things that you should always be doing all of these things and you need to always do, all, you know, so that's probably not the, the right thing. And what had come up uh, yesterday was that, you know, there are probably different things that different OSPOs or different communities want to focus on, um, whatever those things might be. And so I had just kind of rephrased this as OSPO activities under which there could be a variety of things that you would like to focus on within your particular organization. And those activities across the top at the moment are still from that OSPO stages of growth. So this is still for, um, and you're going to hear this whole same story again in the OSPO meeting after this one. <laughs> and so this, this, the top four are still from that, that article that's linked down below there, that PDF. Yeah. So I, these might that's be in the notes relevant. if you didn't see it. Yeah, so these these might be um, relevant for the corporate OSPO side just to help frame things. And across the top, it may be a different collection of things for university OSPOs. And across the top, it may be a different collection of things for scientific software communities. There may be some similarities, but there may be some differences as well. And the reason I like this is because it allows somebody to take a look at this and be like, all right, I'm I'm interested in understanding our education around community engagement within an organization. And so we have that under education and community education. If I want to understand how well I'm doing with respect to community education, you can click on, I don't know, maybe say slide seven. Boom, slide seven. Nope, not that one. Just find the main practice oh, uh, when it says edu community yeah. education, slide five. So this these would be like particular objectives that you're trying to achieve. And I these are made up, but particular 
objectives that you're trying to achieve with respect to community education or objectives that we propose might be good starter objectives for you. And then what are the metrics and metrics models that you could use to help understand how well you're doing against those particular objectives? And is green intended to signal as it does in the spreadsheet uh, functioning nothing. existing? Okay, it means it, nothing. It, it signal it. For a while, when it was a maturity model, it did signal something like kind of mm -hmm. how well, like a you know finished or not finished. But I kind of removed all that. I, I've been trying to play around with the colors, but um, so anyway, it just it, to me it helps locate some of our metrics or metrics models against particular objectives in support of a particular practice. So if we say, for example, in scientific software. In this one, like if the if one of our critical models is whatever we had, what did we? It was the oh, contributor experience. Mm -hmm. Like what? If I was to look at this, and this is again, this is probably not the perfect set of words, but like, what is this help? What is understanding contributor experience helping towards? So, in in my experience with the scientific software world. I think the notion of community is, with the exception of the very large scientific projects, I like those under num focus. Um, so there's there's almost almost like a bifurcated universe where you have the significant massive projects that that exist and are relied on by scientists and others on a large scale, and then you have uh, another collection of significantly smaller projects that that are relied on by a very small group of scientists or perhaps even one lab. So NumFocus, I think, probably, of course, does have this idea of community and community education. And there's, other, there's this other group of scientific open source that has less of a sense of that, I think I would say. Like, or maybe even rejects the notion of community as being some, a thing that they want to or need to create. Right, which would be fine in yeah. this model. That's, this is now saying, mm -hmm. if you don't care about community education, yeah we don't care right that's not something you need to look at more deeply and it's not a, an indication of maturity if you do it or don't do it see what i'm saying mm -hmm. so uh, uh, if i if i look at that same model that we suggested to, uh, for the model working group to develop further and and then i look at this uh, activity chart i feel some buckets of each falls in each of the different boxes. Like, for example, mm -hmm. uh, is the community diverse going in the adoption side? Is it welcoming, educating documentation? They are going on the education side of it. So, like, even within that model, there are small pieces that we are picking from each of these activities and bringing them into that context. And maybe that's okay. I mean, maybe a model could, or a metric could live in a variety of different boxes. It's a useful yes. model. Right. So the model, I think you're making a good point, Manad, that some of the models that are defined here, like how project sustainability is discussed here, or how a new contributor experience um, is defined here, did they certainly cross boundaries inside these boxes in this mess. You know, that's okay. Yeah, um, exactly. So we shouldn't, um, I think this is a helpful framework for understanding sort of categories of things, but it doesn't mean that we have to fit the models or the metrics that we develop neatly into one of them either. I think it's, correct me if I'm not getting this right, but I think it's intended more as a idea generation guide for, in this case, the open source scientific software community. Like these are things that we might think about. Correct. And the list across the top, adoption, education, engagement, and leadership, again, mm -hmm. is from that PDF article mm -hmm. about stages of growth. So, I mean, it may, these, these are probably more applicable in the corporate OSPO sense, and we would have to. And, uh, if you click that link, you download the PDF. Yeah. <laughs> Just in case if you didn't link, link it already. Um, so if you go back, and so those prop, those that go oh, back yeah. to the side, to the side yeah. yeah, so those those activities across the top are probably different based on the conversation we were having with Saeed yesterday. Yeah. 
diversity ospos mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah those categories across the top are probably different for scientific software communities although they could be the same that's completely fine i think for example what i hear in the in the list of new metric models that, that came out of the last meeting uh, and Vinod has helped us to track to existing metrics is is there is this thing of engagement that maybe is not, neither upstream nor downstream, but simply engagement in my project might be, you know, how do I get somebody new to contribute to it? Like I think there are, that might be, that might span all open source scientific software as a consideration. And um, I would add not only how do I get new people to join, but how do I get diverse people, not necessarily only on a DEI sense also, but also from a sustainability point of view, um, are there people who are able to do different kinds of work in my project? Are there people who are able to sustain development in, in different directions? Because I think, um, you know, thinking of a very concrete example, it's very usual to see a lot of people joining for code, but nobody to do the documentation, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So uh, I, I don't know if that's possible to include, but that's part of the concern here as well. Oh, we could include anything. This is this is just an example <laughs> to spark ideas. But anything can change. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, I'm not on the slide that you can see, but I'm over in another separate window, just kind of adding the science perspective um, on this slide and uh, maybe I'll just add it here in the notes as well. So we have some, forgive me, Melissa. Don't, don't, put, it in, don't put it in here because this okay. is part of the, the one that I was using for the corporate ospos. Like I okay. probably just have to make three of these. Yeah. Okay. Right. I'll just, um, I will just leave that there. We have it in our notes. Okay. Now. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So, and it's linked to this metric and metric model slide. So we know what we're talking about here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm trying to keep the, all the circles aligned in the process. Hi, Karthik. Hey, Karthik. so late. That's all right. We're glad to see you. Well, thank you for that document. Um, so we've, uh, in, so we are on the agenda as we um, reviewed some notes from last time, um, which are linked in the, I'm, I get, and somebody put in the notes, and then uh, we've kind of looked over this model, uh, which is, we've talked about these being categories of OSPO development generally, and then we talked about how that might be engaged differently in open source scientific software, um, referring back to some notes that we made. Melissa developed for us and that we worked on in our last meeting a new what we call metric model, which is a collection of metrics for project sustainability and another a new one for contributor experience or contributor health is, mm -hmm. is where we've where we've been and then trying to locate those ideas in this in the primary objectives of what what are what would be a common objective for an open source scientific project, regardless of its size and scale. And and I think um, we kind of landed at this notion of engagement as a perhaps more specific meaning in open source scientific software where it's really, you know, how do I get new people? How do I get new people to do different kinds of work? We're looking for diversity of experience. And so engagement, engagement doesn't necessarily mean upstream or downstream. It really means how do I get people to help with my project, perhaps. So you were using upstream downstream, but you dropped that. Is that what you're saying? We we didn't drop it, but I, I think for in this in discussion, um, and Melissa and Karthik pipe in here. Where, like I know Karthik, you have the entire R universe, so upstream and downstream probably does have a significant meaning for you, and I know that it does for NumFocus, where Melissa is located as well. Um, well, James and I use this term all the time, and so does mm -hmm. ARDC, where when we think of a project um, and think about its sustainability, um, either the project finds sustainability on its own or it's upstreamed into a, another project that is already 
sustainable. So we're, we're talking about where it is in the dependency stack. So you might find confusion by using upstream downstream here with people like me and James. I think, um, I, I think I know what you mean. Uh, so how do you and James use it? Can you yeah, so um, I recently been doing some thinking on this and I, as I walked in, you were talking about dropping the maturity models because it has implications that things are done. Uh, obviously things are never done, things are always evolving, but right. the way I think about maturity models is that very briefly that researchers have one-off uh, spaghetti code or analytic code that they write for a paper that is not packaged into software. So that's one extreme. But if it's a method that they want to share widely, they could package that up in a lightest possible way, put it on GitHub, share it, it's installable, minimal documentation and testing, but it's not robust and it's not engineered for speed. Those are the prototype tools. And we hope that there'll be lots of prototypes just to proof of concept and idea. Some of them will just uh, take hold because there was a desperate need for that tool. And even if it's not perfect, people see the possibility. And then someone, either the original team or someone else comes in and engineers that into a usable project. And now that is research software infrastructure, which is something that needs to be maintained because now it's it's valuable to the community. Again, it's not a final resting place. Over time, the research infrastructure, RSI, research software infrastructure, could become obsolete because the technology changed, a better tool came around, in which case it's fine to be dropped. But they go through this three-step evolution. Um, I'll sh I can share like a slide where I, I describe this. And this yeah. is the terminology that ARDC uses as well for sure. the, their share national... your, Yeah, do you want to share your screen or share the link in chat and have- Yeah, share? I'll just pop the, I'll just pop the link in chat um, as I'm talking, I'll pull up the link. Um, and while we're pulling that up, I think Karthik makes some really, uh, really good points, which gets me thinking that, you know, Matt, you know, this was kind of developed for OSPOs. And I'm I'm not sure, I'm not sure that it really applies in in just kind of the more broad sense of, you know, looking at at, you know, scientific. Um, you know, scientific software and in the space that we've been talking about. It might apply if you're talking about, say, you know, academic OSPOs who are, you know, have a research component. But I'm not sure, I'm not sure how much that that work really applies to this this space. And now I'll be quiet and let's go back to what Karthik wanted to walk through. Um, I, th I think that's it. Um... So the reason I mentioned this is that what a once great domain name, by the way. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, thanks. I I, <laughs> I got that fifteen years ago. Um, uh, so when something becomes research software infrastructure, the way to sustain that again, you you run into standard sustainability challenges. You got to fund the project and the people building that code. One solution is to upstream that. So, simple example would be. The national labs have software engineers all the time yeah. that are that are funded by the federal budget. Mm -hmm. If they're a part of your core contributor team, they can just take on maintenance. Uh, and so then you're no longer trying to find FTEs for the project. So you've sort of upstreamed it to a place that sees value in maintaining it and they have permanent staff left to maintain it. Somebody can um, take notes on this. Uh, because... and, and then the other way, of course, is for an individual project to just kind of struggle and cobble together money from different places or get in-kind developer time from their core contributor team who are employed somewhere else. Um, anyway, this is the cycle that I see. Things can fall into that final bin, stay there for a while, fall back out. Um, but a subset of the analysis code becomes prototype, a sm sm smaller subset of that becomes sort of fixed if I'm using terms from evolution. Mm -hmm. And anything that's fixed can also fall out of favor over time. Um, yeah. The reason I, I like this framing is that then it gives, um, thank you, um, thank you, Don, for the context around whether or not this might apply to an OSPO itself. I think it, 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 it makes sense for researchers because when you're trying to discover tools, 
you, you'd like to know where this tool is. Is it someone's idea that's just been prototyped? It's not really meant for production use. Or this is something well-backed, well-sustained that you can rely upon and trust because you have limited time to figure out what tool to use. Um, and this, this is, seems far more useful than the lifecycle badges about uh, evolving, maturing, stable, et cetera, because it's all just a static point in time. Yeah, with that, I'll stop. No, I think that's a really helpful additional framing, Karthik. Um, so I just, uh, I see Anessa is able to join us now. Um, Anessa, to catch you up, we've been talking about um, just how this different, these different ways of thinking about open source program offices um, that we've been using to frame discussions about ASPOs in, in the larger chaos community applies in, in different ways and maybe not exactly to the ways that um, things work in open source scientific software. And uh, Karthik pointed out the different ways that upstream and downstream engagement are understood and talked about in, in the scientific software community. Um, and that is linked here in his inundata.org slide, which is, I think, uh, yeah, I'm not sure, Karthik. I think I think we've been. Go ahead, Karthik and Don. Um, because if you're, if, if you're talking, if you're talking, dialogue going here. Um, yeah, if you're talking about industry ospos, there's obviously a ton of work there. I've been talking to Salona lately about some of this, um, and clearly they, they've thought about this much more and for a longer time in practice. I feel like academic ospos, other than Said and uh, Stephen and you know, maybe the folks at Santa Cruz, no one else has really done very much. I'm, I'm actually supposed to be in DC today with Saeed, but um, there's an airline meltdown and I spent eight hours at the airport yesterday not being able to yeah. get on a flight. I actually um, read about that. So you must fly United. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had a <laughs> Sorry lovely to hear that. day at the airport. Um, yeah. Anyway, you know, because I'm not there. Other I, people at least. Yeah, uh, I'm free to, to be on this call today. But I think academic OSPOs are still trying to figure things out and they don't know what it is they would like to see. I have tons of ideas. Uh, I don't represent the Berkeley OSPO, but I think uh, the challenges are different, right? Yeah. Uh, like we don't have like a capitalist motivation around supporting open source software. So it could be things like understanding which projects your academic institution contributes to, which ones your, your organization leads, what kind of impact it's having. And if something is having meaningful impact, you wanna try and see how to support that, and elevate that. Like try to get it some institutional funding, try to put it in touch with other PIs who can build funding in their, in their own grant proposals. Right now, nobody at Berkeley knows who, who does what. We are like the most siloed organization ever. I just met some guy because of my kid's daycare. And he's like, wait a minute, you do open source? It's, I do open source. It's like, we have known about each other for 10 years. We've never actually met. So we just have these little mini meetings during drop off and pick up. Um, you know, and then it's it's so tough. Uh, I think an OSPO is critical to elevate that kind of conversation. I, and then I just, have to, a, just to- I have a similar story, Karthik. The reason I know about our, our Bond Life Science Center and Precision Medicine Center here in Missouri, working with open sources because my kids were friends with the guy who ran their data center. <laughs> yeah, that is wild. No. Um, yeah, so the DC meeting that I was supposed to go to was about open source policy uh, in, in the federal government. And they had a whole track this afternoon, which I think will happen. I'll hopefully get access to the notes is around uh, incentives. And, um, to me, that is a really tough one to solve, and it's not something that could be solved easily. But I, James and I have been talking like weekly because we're working on this special project about incentives and credit for open source. And I think the really hard thing is that um, it's still really hard to demonstrate the value of open source so unless we can actually see where it's being used and how it's being used it's hard to justify anything to an OSPO. So I think that 
issue exists outside of OSPOs, uh, but it's very relevant to an OSPO. And so to, I'm, I'm wish I had a, I wish I had a diagram of the picture that's in my head, but imagine, if you will, a Venn diagram where the universities, the academic OSPOs that we talk about, which as you said, Kurt, like they are very nascent, mm -hmm. they try to connect to a specific universities, commercialization or technology transfer. Yeah. group as part of what they do in some cases that's the main part of what they do in other cases mm -hmm. there's there's discussion about in order to sustain science and the funding that we have for science we need to sustain software and that becomes part of us of an infrastructure that needs to exist inside of each university like yeah. and this is where the research software engineering i don't want to call it a movement but i don't know what else to call it um that's fine discussion begins because yeah. really for a university to continue to do science they they do need to make some kind of investment in the software that is used to create science if if they don't want to pay exorbitant licensing fees forever to a commercial entity um right and i feel like researchers have moved on whether or not universities can support them so the number of pis i talk to who say oh we pay like ten thousand dollars a year for this very specialized commercial software, I don't hear that very much these days. Everyone yeah. is cobbling together some open source solution. Um, I mean, 15 and, years and like ago, R was my entry into the open source world. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I mean, for like 20 years ago, yeah. I was studying. Well, you're older than me, Karthik, so. <laughs> uh, am I? I don't know. No, you're uh, not. <laughs> uh, I, I, was not. <laughs> I was studying. Uh, like root structures using cameras and specialized software. There's one vendor who built the hardware and the software, and it would take months to get them to fix any bug. It was just absolute chaos. I don't think my video because I just swallowed coffee grounds. Excuse me. Yeah, I don't think we operate that way anymore. Um, and so to me, like, I don't see the, I, I don't have much insights into the tech transfer possibilities of an academic OSPO. Because tech transfers are always existed. So I'm sure an academic OSPO can sort of take on that functionality as well. Well, yeah, the, Saeed, yeah, Saeed and I were talking in the academic OSPO meeting yesterday about how I and both he and I have used open source licensing to avoid or circumvent discussions with lawyers. Like the second yeah. that you say tech transfer and that office gets involved, you just have more meetings. And so mm -hmm. I've open sourced my research software principally to avoid lots of meetings with lawyers. Yeah, same here. Um, so the point that I that I quickly wanted to get to was that in all of these discussions, chaos metrics seem to come up mm -hmm. because we need a way to understand how projects are doing in the context of other projects based at that institution of similar age of comparable domain, so that we can make some sense of this. And going back to Sean's earlier point, if universities have realized that software is critical for the science that they do, which is critical for recruitment and everything else, then they want to make sure the software is sustainable more than it is now. Mm -hmm. And so if, uh, you know, my vision of an ideal OSPO employs like a director and maybe some engineers, and they, they employ some version of a chaos dashboard, for say Berkeley, they can start to see what projects are doing at scale. And if some project is, is at risk of just falling apart because they've not diversified core contributors, it's the same two people maintaining it, uh, their communication channels are completely dead, then there's somebody who can have a, a meeting with them to say like, what's going on? Where do you need help? That, that's one type of support. The second is the software is, is complete, like feature complete to some point the PIs don't have any more funded time to work on it. So it's just kind of done, it's out there. But uh, something comes along, like a security update, a dependency change something. It's not a ton of effort to make those changes to keep the software still building correctly. But someone who's a really busy PI just gets overwhelmed. They, they have 3,000 emails in their inbox. 
they don't see their dependent bot alerts. It's just overwhelming. So they say, you know what, screw this. I don't have time for this. The build will fail. Lots of people, depending on this, will not do anything about it. They'll just struggle. They'll email you even more, which doesn't really help. Some A group of engineers at the OSPO could see this at scale and come in and say, you know what, we are seeing this vulnerability pop up, not just for you, but for a bunch of others. So we, we have distilled what it is you need to do to fix this in the, in the simplest way possible. So then they go ahead and do that. And the software is now sustainable for a period of time longer. That could mm -hmm. be like months. So to me, this is like massive added value where any open source software in the academic space is just like, you know, roll the dice and see what you get. You don't know if it'll work today or tomorrow or it'll stop working next week, mm -hmm. but but we can sort of extend that reliability phase a little bit longer mm -hmm. by having some agency within institutions monitor those institutions' contributions. I suppose it, the institution component can can be skipped if somebody could do chaos at scale uh, as a some mass surveillance machine, because all you need to know is where things exist. Yeah. If you know that the canonical code repository, you can do this like across the country if you wanted to. We can, but then we can the, do it. We just need somebody to buy the servers, right? <laughs> exactly. It, it's it's the cost of the infrastructure. And then you're not going to make policy across institutions. You can make policy within institutions that you can ask people to comply with. So I think it it, it still has to come down to an academic OSPO. But I think this is where the chaos metrics can truly shine. And we can start to think about um, other types of models that could be built based on the chaos trace data to maybe even start to do predictive modeling on when projects are on the trajectory to failure mm -hmm. and if anything could be done about it. Not that everything needs to be saved. I, I think. That's... This is the work that Vladimir does. I, I, I need to dig into that some more because he's used data from Apache Foundation to, to model out when projects might succeed or fail. Yeah, and how I think from a chaos perspective, we have been historically non-judgmental about what success and failure mean. I think exactly. In yeah. The op yeah, in the open source scientific space, however, I think we are trying to, we're trying to work with this community to to really understand what is sustainable. Like, what does it mean to a, I think it means something different to the non-focus organization, for example, than it might mean to a particular scientist at a university who throws his software um, out into the universe and either does or does not see it get uptaken and used and maybe perhaps ultimately maintained by some other party as part of the research, soft, the research software infrastructure, which is what this last yeah. little bubble in your diagram represents yeah. and i think that's what you just walked us through if i'm understanding yeah yeah um and i think more people should produce prototypes because we want to hear more ideas captured in code see what it looks like discard a bunch of them and then keep the ones that make sense i guess the flip side to all this is that um when projects are done the developers should actually make it very clear that it's no longer being maintained and then take steps to make sure it's archived in Software Heritage or Zenodo, uh, that somebody wanting to spin this up can spin this up in the future for a reproducibility reason. And I think the third one, which is really hard, which is something an OSPO could potentially help with, is point them to other tools that could be used. Um, so one amazing example that I came across this past year by a person who I don't like personally, but I admire what he's doing with the code. He's, he's sort of. This, just <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, then I won't mention the, I won't mention the names of the software itself. But this software has it's been widely used for yeah. twenty years. And, I think I know exactly what software you're talking about. <laughs> and this person is a is an academic and is retiring. Mm -hmm. And they they have said, you know, when I retire, I'm retired. So I'm going to tell everybody using the software that you should stop using it here's the alternative. And if you're using an exact type of application, here's an example of how to do that in the new thing. Walk that through. And then send multiple notices saying, at, at this year I will retire, and then I'm pulling the plug. 
But the software has uh, never been distributed open source, right? Oh, this one has been distributed open source. Okay, so we yes, might be okay. thinking about something else, which is good. Yeah. I just want to sow yeah. confusion at this point about who this <laughs> yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. But, but to me, like, that is a lot of effort and that is a lot of care. But we can provide guidance on how to do that. So even I uh, built something useful for a few years. I lost interest. I put a note saying it'll stop working in six months. And now three years later, I get emails from people from government saying we use this because for some reason it's still functioning. And I tell them, oh, I don't maintain this anymore. That note has been on there forever. Yeah. But it would be nice for more people to do that so that you don't discover something in a Google search. The tutorials look nice. Yep. And, and then, then you've spent like six months using that. And then you run into somebody at a conference and say, oh, that person abandoned that software yeah. two and a half years ago. It's like, yeah. and I'm, I'm oh, the, God, I, what do I do now? Yeah. And I think I need to bring us back here because we've got about a minute left on our schedule today. I think we've had a really great discussion. Thanks to the, everyone's work here and, uh, you know, especially Karthik and Melissa and Anissa, a lot, a lot of discussion going into this, and it, which is awesome. I, I hope you have more flights canceled, Karthik, because this, this was great to have your perspective here today. I don't really wish that for you, but you know what I'm saying. Um, we didn't get to the last item on the agenda, so we'll just um, move that up to next time and, and hopefully continue this discussion uh, when this group gathers again in a couple of weeks. Anybody else got any final things to say or? I guess just that in, in two weeks time, me and Anessa will be away, right, Anessa? Because we'll both be at SciPy. Right. Yes, I I think there is a good chance we still can join. We'll have to look at the schedule. But also maybe we could have a, a get together in person if you're at SciPy as well and continue this conversation. Yeah. And I think some of us will also be at Fosse in Portland that week. If it's in two weeks, right? On the SciPy in Portland? 13th? No, Fosse is in Portland. So right, I know Liz right. and I will not be on this call because we'll be at another conference that yeah. same week. So maybe a different crowd entirely. Well, let's, I mean, we maybe, maybe my, my point was maybe we should 